She had all the power in comparison to me. I was dating this girl, and it was not the healthiest of situations. We were in this church. She knew everybody. She knew the elders. She knew the pastors. They didn't know me. I was new in town. And as we're dating, I'm starting to realize this is not healthy because she's lying to everybody about everything, and she's trying to get me to lie as well. And up till then, I hadn't always made the right decisions, but I had never liked to be someone who didn't tell the truth. And so it was very uncomfortable, so we broke up. And I really thought about leaving the church because I didn't know anybody compared to comparison to her, and she had all the influence, all the power, and they didn't even realize that she was lying all the time about a lot of different things, They're lying to her families about her schoolwork, and lying, there, she was literally lying about every, where she was the night before. It was just a pattern that she had, and I really thought about leaving the church, but I really felt the Lord said to actually plant, and it was highly uncomfortable. It was not fun, but over time, things began to change, and luckily, she got help and, and is actually doing really well now. There's a lot of trauma in, the, in her past that led her to make those decisions. But had I left, one is I never would have met my wife about a year or two later, and Red Church would not have been planted because that was the church that ended up planting us. So leaving was not the right decision. One of the issues that we have in our culture is shallow living. We have shallow relationships. We have shallow knowledge. We, there's a lot of things that we know. We know about a lot of things, but very little about a lot of things. We have very shallow relationships. We, we think if we're online with someone that we actually know them in a deep way. Uh, we have uh, shallow marriages, shallow faith and beliefs in a lot of ways. And part of this is because we have kind of a me-focused culture, but we also have a culture that um, just changes if we don't like something, like pretty quickly. Um, Richard Foster highlighted that what the world needs is not smarter people. What the world needs is not more talented people. What he, he says actually the world needs is deeper people, people who have a depth of spiritual maturity and a depth of relationship. And that's what we were, we're talking about today is discovering purpose and dealing with one of the biggest barriers to actually digging deeper roots. And one of the key drivers to growing more mature and deeper is one of the ones that we reject the most in our culture. So if you're a guest today, I just want to welcome you, those of you that are here, those of you that are, are online, so glad that you're with us. Uh, I'm Pastor Jace O'Neill, the lead pastor at Red Church, and we're in this series called Discovering Purpose, that God, we might have different giftings and different callings and different things of that nature, but there are some things that all of us are called to do, and if these things are missing, We'll always struggle with a sense of meaning, a, a sense of purpose. So today, our big truth is this. God has called the church to bring pro, pro, positive change to the world, but this means we are to be contributors, not consumers. What I mean by that is, is that Jesus, he says he's going to build his church. The church is God's plan A to bring hope to the world. Why? It's because the church's role is to bring Jesus to the world. That is the strategy. The church is more than just a strategy, but it's not less than that. He chose the church to bring about hope and change in the world that we live in, and that requires us to be involved because the church is not an organization. The church is a gathering of believers together. Ephesians 4, 12 and 16 says this, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain the unity of the faith, mature manhood, the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceit schemes. We are to grow up in every way. Everyone say every in every way, into Christ, which each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This verse confronts a current view that many have in our culture about church. And it's not just about church. We have this about almost everything, about our jobs, about relationships, that it's there for me. The church is just there for me. And obviously, there are times when all of us need help. We all go through difficult seasons. But there's this concept, the church is there for me as a consumer, and, and it's to serve me. The church, the people are to serve me. We have that perspective in almost everything. My spouse is there to serve me, my vision, my goals, uh, our jobs. Everything is me. It's kind of 
utilitarian, that we are using people and others as objects to get what we want. This issue that we're talking about today is one of the issues that upset people the most whenever it's spoken on. There, there are three issues I've seen in our culture uh, that, that really people respond to, and it's not always the ones you expect. One is greed. When you talk about finances, people don't like talking about that one. The other one is pride. Man, I, I've, I've preached on pride, and somebody in the third row is just like, like looking at me, like, like demon eyes, just like staring me down. Number three is this one, when it talks about serving, because it steps on the toes of one of our, our idols, and that is our, where our time and our talents go. Our time, our talents are one of the biggest idols, because where we spend our time will reveal what we really worship. Where we spend our money will reveal what we really worship. Where we use our talents will reveal what we really worship. But what's interesting about this verse is it's not just, oh, serving to help other people. You know, that's part of it, serving and and you're investing in each other. But also what it's highlighting here is that serving one another within the local church helps us to grow up, helps us to grow spiritually more mature. We have this thing in our culture that uh, maturity is somehow uh, has been um, hijacked, that if you know a lot about what the Bible says, then you are spiritually mature. That is not an accurate definition of spiritual maturity. I've been around professors who are scholars that are are not spiritually mature. Knowledge itself does not lead to spiritual maturity. If someone knows a lot but does not have deep relationships and are connected in a community, there's likely immaturity there. If someone knows a lot and there's not an active of serving within the local church and even outside of the local church, there's probably some growth that, that is still needed in that particular area. I've heard people say things like this, I don't, I don't need other people. Like, I'm good. Like, just me and God, I, I could just be mature by myself. I'm good. Respectfully, no, you can't. No, you can't. In fact, saying that is a sign of immaturity to begin with because it goes against what Scripture says. This verse is highlighting how serving grows us. And it actually starts in chapter 3, but in chapter 4, it talks about unity of the faith. It talks about becoming mature, fullness of Christ. All are highlighting that doing the work of ministry helps in growing throughout these different ways. So serving the local church helps us to grow more spiritually mature. And when we aren't serving, it's often a sign that there's something lacking or missing. So you might be sitting there saying, are you saying that if I'm not serving in the local church, does that mean I'm going to be stunted spiritually mature? Am I going to, is that going to stunt my maturity? I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. The Bible clearly states that. It highlights here in Ephesians. It goes even more specific in 1 Corinthians when it talks about parts of the body. Hands and feet, mouth and eyes and ears. And it's talking about the church working together to accomplish the ministry. Ephesians makes it clear it is not the pastor's job or the staff's job to do ministry. It's the leader's job to equip the saints. The word saints doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you're a follower of Christ. It's to equip the followers of Christ to do the ministry. And that doing the ministry grows us spiritually mature helps us to grow spiritually mature. Now understand, um, there are some right now, maybe you're going through a challenging season, maybe life is crazy, get it. There's grace. The pastor side of me, empathetic, but, but also truth has to be spoken as well because there are some seasons where we have to kind of work through some things. The problem is those things, that line in which I need to really do something else, has gone so much that almost nobody's actually this is a nationwide problem. Many of them are serving because even little things become reasons why we should do this. I want to highlight here a video of a young man and their family actually serves together. And I've seen this. Um, I've seen marriages who are struggling, who they serve together, and it's actually helped their marriage. I've seen things where they've gone through dramatic situation as they serve as an act of worship together. It's actually grown them spiritually mature. It's almost counterintuitive. It's like, oh, we just need to recover. And there are times for that. I'm not saying there's not. But we have to be cautious because the solution that maybe God's offering is the one we may be resisting. Here's a video of a young man named Landon. It feels important to me to serve here because I've been so encouraged on the way and so many people here have boosted me to learn the way of God. And just I want to spread the word and how much God loves us and how much I love him. And I want to be able to pass down our Christianity through generations. I feel like it just, I don't know, it feels good to 
do helpful things and it just makes people feel positive. You'd see the young man just trying to find the language to what he's saying, but he's like, people are encouraging me. I love that I get to share the gospel with others. He's highlighting that there's something he wants to spread, you know, the faith to others. At a young age, he starts to get it. And one of the reasons this is happening is he's actually serving with his family. They serve together in many cases. This is, uh, we've seen in our own family and, and, and you know, uh, with, within our kids, as they serve, they love going through trunk or treat, which we did last week. By the way, thank you for those of you that served during that and who, who stayed and were part of that. I, I, the number, I don't know the exact number, but it was about 23 to 2,500 people came to that event, and we had a lot of chance to share. Some of you guys were sharing seeds of spiritual conversations that came from that. Uh, I love how my kids go through the event, and then they actually want to serve. They're like, okay, I'm done with this. Uh, can I help out? And that's been something that didn't happen when they were little, but as they're doing it, the, the, and what's happened is my older daughter is now there's purpose for her to help be a part of it and not just consuming it, but being a part of it. So now there's some arguments in this. It's like, oh, well, you know, what this is talking about is, is saints, you know, doing ministry. It's, that's, that's not supposed to be the local church. We're supposed to be outside the walls of the local church. So what this is talking about is the leaders of the church are meant to raise up the saints to do ministry in the world. Well, that's spiritually true, but that's more in the Great Commission, but that's not what this text is talking about. You highlight here, the body grow that it builds itself up in love. It is specifically talking about the local church, that the believers are meant to serve within the local church. Obviously, Christians should be outside of the four walls, using their influence as well outside of the four walls of the church, but it is not in exclusion of. It's not like, oh, we come to church and then we go and do stuff outside of the four walls. No, we are called to use our giftings, our talents, our time, to invest in one another for the building up of the body itself up in love. Theologian Richard Koken says this, it is all too easy to be content to be a spiritual Peter Pan who wanted to remain forever a boy and never grow up. Instead, Paul says, we need to grow up. See, the problem that we have in our culture, and this shows up in our relationships, it shows up in how we treat each other, it shows up in politics, it shows up in in how we approach jobs, how we interact with people at church, is that we have this immature Peter Pan perspective that it's about me and we don't really want to grow up because to grow up is repressive. See, maturity is now looked at as something very different and then we wonder why we struggle with fulfillment. We, str- we wonder why our relationships aren't as deep as we want them to be. I'll give you an example. I, this is not a political statement, although it deals a little bit uh, with a political uh, perspective of two individuals, uh, especially, you know, voting's come up Tuesday. So, uh, <clears throat> so there was two men in the church, and they consistently would complain. And I would hear them complaining. And this is sometime back. I don't, I don't think either of them attend here, because this is like probably eight years ago. And um, they were complaining how they are sick and tired of their tax dollars helping other people and enabling other people who aren't doing their job and are basically taking advantage of the system. They're upset about that. They're, they're complaining like, hey, they should not get a free ride and my tax is paying for them. And, and they had a lot of verses to back that up. And true enough, there are some verses that can highlight if people are gaming the system, there are problems with that. Here's what's so interesting about that. They are so angry and so upset that they work hard and there's people who aren't working hard, and they're getting a free ride. And I just wanted to walk up to them and I'm like, wow, that is a big problem, right? It's a big problem in politics. Isn't it a big problem in church too? Because neither of these two men served, or if they gave anything, it wasn't very much at all. And I want to sit there and go, are you getting a free ride? See, you're so big in seeing the speck in other people's eyes, you're not seeing the plank in your own eye. That's the definition of hypocrisy is we're complaining other people are going to free ride, but then when we approach marriages, churches, jobs, we are expecting a free ride. Welcome this morning. Glad that you came. God chose the church to be God's plan A to bring hope to the world. Meaning this, it is Jesus, he's building his church Why? We're the proclaimers of Christ. He is the solution. That means that no matter how much education changes we bring or how much governmental change that we bring, that nothing will change unless Christ is at the center of it. And that's why churches are so important. 
The church is God's plan A to bring hope. That's why I'm always suspicious of people who are always criticizing the church. There's tons of YouTube channels. There's un- a lot of traveling ministers will criticize the church, but yet they're dependent on the church. The church is the bride of Christ. Could you imagine somebody walking up and highlighting all the flaws of your wife? Somebody would be missing some teeth. Because I don't have that problem because my wife's perfect, but I'm just highlighting. I think that this perspective is, is, is insulting often. That doesn't mean we're blind to obvious situations when wrong is obviously done. But if God loves the church, we'll love the things he loves. And if the church is God's plan A to bring hope to the world, we need to be cautious of what's going on. And they did this massive study to highlight what is the biggest threat in the American church. The biggest threat. 77% of pastors says the biggest threat to their ministry is the lack of people serving within the ministry because they actually can't get done what needs to get done. The biggest threat, 77% of pastors. If we're following Jesus, we'll love what he loves. We'll see the problems in the world. And I debated whether I should say this or not. This is normally something I would say to um, maybe in our vision night or I would say like in a leadership huddle. But I was praying about it And I'm like, okay, God, should I say this or not? And God brought me to multiple verses where Paul did this very thing. So when we look at the books of the New Testament, we often look at them as like as individuals. Like, I'm going to approach this book of the Bible as a person. But that's not how they were written, most of them. Most of them were written to a church, and that was read in public. So there are actual people being rebuked in a public forum. Like, this person who's doing this thing, that's you, Uh, you're rebuked because this is sin. Now, we're not going to rebuke anybody publicly, so just, you can breathe. You can breathe. (laughs) Um, But, um, and so if you're a guest here, this part doesn't apply to you. I would say to you, though, if you're watching online or if you're here as a guest, that the truth is still true. Whether you find that Red Church is your church home or somewhere else, this truth is still true. So be processing that as you make decisions. But we did this, we looked at this, and only 23% of people at Red Church are serving, which has never been the case in the history of Red Church. It should be closer to 50% with 30% of people pre-serving. They're in the process of, of starting to serve. Because this, this, this biblical principle is that serving one another within the local church is part of our spiritual discipleship process. So maybe it's time to get in the game. Maybe start serving for the first time. Maybe it's time to get back in the game. Or maybe it's time to step, take a step up. Maybe the issue is taking, um, maybe you actually have leadership gifts or skills that aren't being utilized in what you're doing. Richard Koken goes on to say this, we are, we are God's gifts to his church. So my church is not just there in order to bless me as though I'm a shopper filling my basket in the supermarket. The opposite is true. We are all saved and given to our churches as gifts to bless others by serving them. We are not meant to be consumers, but contributors. Quite simply, church growth is a team game, so don't neglect your ministry, leaving other exhausted church members to try and do it for you. And every Christian has a ministry. That doesn't mean you're going to have a nonprofit. It doesn't mean you're going to be a preacher God has given you talents and giftings and experiences and passions to use within your local church. And what's interesting is, is studies show that people, the longer someone who's been a part of a church, the longer they've been a Christian, so not just one church, but a church, the less likely they are to serve. And by the way, they serve that actually get stuck. Mature believers get stuck just like immature believers. And this is one of the areas they get stuck in. It's, a, it's one of the indicators someone's gotten their foot stuck in the mud. So on our own, we're all, we've, sin separates us from God. He's the connection to truth, uh, hope, love. On our own, we will all look to serve ourselves. We'll all look to our time to serve ourselves. Or we will fall serve. We will serve to get what we want. And that's revealed in our response to our serving. Big question is where might God be calling you to serve within your local church? We're all, to be called, we're all to be contributors, not consumers. So we've learned the principle. How do we live this out? If you're taking notes, write this down. One is confront a cultural view of serving with a biblical truth. All right, Ephesians, he said, and he gave, basically apostles, the leaders of the church, 
to equip the saints, believers, not just people who are perfect, for the work of ministry, doing the ministry, for the building up the body until we attain. So this is highlighting, this is why it's so hard in our culture, because everything in our culture, it's about you. It's about our vision, our purpose, what, 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 what my dream is. So this is countercultural to everything we're told in our entire life. It's countercultural to much that we, we hear in therapy. We have a lot of really, I have a counseling background, we have a lot of really good Christian counselors in our church, um, but even sometimes the things I hear from other people from therapy are, is completely not biblical. First of all, it says he gave. This is Jesus. Jesus gave. Jesus gave the building of the church until we attain, meaning we have not arrived yet. None of us have arrived yet. We may be saved, but we're not mature. No matter how long we've been around, we think we're mature, we're not mature. The lie of the world is put yourself first. And this is a, there's a big thing right now, is self-care. And there's a lot of truth in that, self-care. You know, it's important to know how to take rest and take vacations and things of that nature. But taken to the extreme, it's not healthy at all. Taken to the extreme, it, it's very self-centered, very self-focused. So it takes something that is actually true, has truth in it, and it's corrupted to be the ultimate truth. And then you have this culture of, well, I'm going to set all these boundaries, and boundaries aren't bad, by the way. But some boundaries are essentially like, I won't be inconvenienced. I won't be challenged. And so something that may have truth in it is corrupted to something that is not meant to be. So we have what we call false prophets. Why do I use the term false prophets? False prophets are some people who speak the truth or think they're speaking the truth. Some know they're distorting it, and some think they're telling the truth. The, the term false prophet, people are actually following them. So people are listening to what they're saying. So there are some times that we even speak things that are not necessarily true in relationships and conversations. Here's the issue. Some of the false prophets say, don't invest in anything that steals your energy. Well, that's not biblical. Or don't invest in anything if you don't get something out of it. That's something that's huge on social media now. Don't invest anything if you don't get something out of it. Aren't we glad Jesus didn't approach us that way? I'm not going to give my life until they give you know, they're not worth it. They're not worthy of this. See, a lot of the philosophy is completely contradictory to the Word of God. In fact, this philosophy is a philosophy of, of ascedia. I mentioned this in the last series, but I think it's important in this one. Philosophy of ascedia, ascedia is one of the seven deadly sins. We refer to it as slothfulness, but it loses part of its meaning. Slothfulness is essentially we think is laziness, but that's not necessarily the full meaning of, of ascedia. In fact, you can be very busy and be extremely guilty of ascedia or slothfulness. One of the seven deadly sins is it does a cost analysis. What a cost analysis? What's in this for me? If I don't get anything out of it, I'm not going to do it. A person driven by ascedia is driven by their own needs, their own comfort, their own interests. This has been recognized for generations as one of the deadliest sins, and now it's being celebrated. We promote it. Even Christian authors write about it. This is why serving within the local church is so important to growing us spiritually and mature. It breaks the bondage of what am I getting out of this? Serving helps us to realize it's not just what am I getting out of it. It's God, who am I blessing? How am I honoring you? It's the opposite of being self-focused. Look, I get it. I know it's tough to figure out family time when you're family i've got four kids two dogs you know even when you're single it's hard in this crazy crazy world that we live in like i, I get it. there's grace there's mercy trying to figure it out but this is why time reveals what we worship because at some point we have to figure out the priorities have to be in order the problem is is we often put the wrong things as the highest priority Again, in America, we often sit there and go, what you know, if I've been around, I'm more spiritually mature. That's not necessarily true. Many people get stuck in certain seasons of their spiritual maturity and don't get out of it, and this is one of the areas that keeps them stuck. So I'm going to give you some, some ways that serving actually helps grow us. And, and I literally had to cut a ton of content. I, I could speak on this for an entire semester of, of the things that the Word of God highlights on how serving grows us spiritually mature. But I tried to focus in uh, on just a few of them for the sake of time. One is time management. 
where our time goes reveals what we truly worship. Saying yes to one thing means saying no to something else. It reveals what we value. Saying yes to serve on Sundays sometimes means saying no to baseball games. And I just want to give a caution real quick. Sometimes, out of compassion, when you hear somebody's going through a tough time, sometimes the motive isn't out of compassion. Sometimes the motive is, I don't want to feel guilty, so I'm going to give the same advice, so I'm not the only one with this kind of truth in my life. But sometimes people give this as trying to be cautioned, like, oh, you got so much going on, maybe you should just stop serving. I want to contend to you that that might be stunting that person's spiritual growth. Now, I'm not highlighting there's never a time. I'm not highlighting that there aren't times when we do that. I am highlighting that often we say that thinking it's helping when it's actually hurting that person. Time management. Number two is self-control. Fruit of the Spirit. See, serving helps develop self-control. Self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is this. When Jesus is the Lord of our life, this area in our life will grow. All right? Self-control is the ability to do what's important, not what's urgent. So if we're not growing spiritually mature in our time, we'll always choose us. Always. When we don't prioritize serving one another, we miss opportunities to be more like Christ. Number three is developing the, uh, spirit of, the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness. Faithfulness is to be utterly reliable. So when often people call out last minute or or, and that's not just one time, but a, a ha- habitual thing, or when, you know, things like that happen, it may be showing an immaturity. It's not dependable. And look, we're, we've all been there. We've all had challenging seasons where we're maybe not the best at this. But serving grows us. And here's one way. Everyone hear me. If you're watching online, this is important. When we serve within the local church, and also when we take other steps of obedience that the Lord calls us to do, that's hard. This is what happens. Often, crud that's inside us rises to the top. Because that's what happens when you obey the Lord. Either because he's bringing it up to to help us deal with it, or there's spiritual warfare where the enemy's trying to use it to distract us. That's why it's hard. Like, we tell people, if people who come on staff, like, when you join ministry to actually do it as a vocation, there's going to be spiritual warfare because that's what happens. When you begin to serve, that also happens. It often is bringing up stuff within our life that we have to deal with. This is why it is not always helpful to sit there and say, well, you should stop, you should just stop serving because there's so much going on. Because if what's rising to the top needs to be dealt with, then stop serving doesn't solve the issue. We just stop ignoring it and therefore we miss an opportunity to grow. So when we just sit there and say, you just need to take a break, that may be true. But it doesn't solve the inner issue. We're just ignoring the issue. We miss an opportunity to grow faithful. For example, if inside of you, deep inside, there's this need for approval, then when you serve, what's going to happen over a period of time is that you're going to be upset because people didn't affirm you the way you needed to be affirmed. And then it's never dealt with. We just get offended and move on. Or if what's inside of us is comfort as an idol, then we're not going to want to show up on time. We're not going to want to be dependable because we value our own comfort. Or if we like to, if we're self, self-focused and we're worshiping ourselves, then we're going to be offended to serve other people. We're not going to make that a priority. See, when we serve, and this is true of other things as well, if you, if you go to fast, the stuff that's in you is going to rise to the top. That's why people get angry. You know, people sit there and say, oh, it's, you're just hangry. Well, that's actually a sign of gluttony. Hangry is not an excuse. It's a sign that we're controlled by our stomachs more than we like to admit. I, I've said that a couple times this year. No one ever says amen. <laughs> it's true. When you take a step of obedience, often the stuff that's in us comes to the surface. And many people do not have the spiritual maturity to recognize that, oh, this is something I have to deal with. What we tend to do is, oh, it's their fault. They should be doing this. It's that fault. If you didn't do this, and one of the signs you can know that you're doing this is you're always focused on what everyone else is doing wrong. People do this all the time. People do this in marriages. Instead of dealing, for example, maybe you've seen this at work. Someone's not doing a good job at their job, so what they'll do is look at what they're not doing at their job. I have kids. They do this all the time. Up, up. This happened this morning. 
Up, you keep saying this word, you keep saying this word. It's like you said that word 25 times yesterday. It's a tactic that we don't even realize we do sometimes is that we defer by projecting onto other people so the focus isn't on us. Serving reveals this stuff. Number four is loving others. We have to learn to show love because people are going to offend you. People are going to disappoint you. People are going to upset. I know sometimes people come to church thinking that Christians are perfect, right? I mean, that's, there's this halo that everyone has, but the truth is people will offend you and disappoint you. And serving one another helps us to love other people more. In the book, The Bait of Satan, it talks about the devastation of unforgiveness, holding grudges. And what's up happening is people will cut out roots and they'll get offended somewhere and they'll change. And this is true in marriages. It's true in friendships. It's true in churches. It's true in jobs. Here's the danger. When you take out the roots and you go somewhere else, you have now made it more uh, easier to cut the roots out again and start all over again. This is why when someone has a divorce, they're way more likely to divorce again. Because we've, we're used to cutting out the roots. So loving people, you know, it's easy to, we, we can find a million reasons why we should just cut out the roots. You know, there was a woman who was a part of our church some time back who she, she spent all this time going, Pastor, I think I need to stop serving. I may need to leave the church because the people I serve with are so spiritually immature. I just can't deal with it. And I wanted to sit there and go, that's interesting. With all due respect, I think this is revealing your immaturity, not theirs. Some of what she's saying is somewhat true. There were some people on the team that were spiritually immature. Her response to it was equally or more so immature. Number five, develop skills. It helps sharpens us. We have to learn to choose joy. Serving, you have to learn to choose joy. Look, I took my kids, you know, we, we, we didn't do a lot of things we normally do on a vacation to save it for the fall, but we went to Great Wolf Lodge. It's easier to have joy at the Great Wolf Lodge. It really is. It's also expensive. That's why you had to save up for it. <laughs> we had to save up for it. Um, and the, we, so um, it develops leadership. Serving helps resist self-centered culture. And serving helps us and causes us to have to dig deeper. Here's a big important piece. Serving requires us to dig deeper in our relationship with the Lord. John 15, 5 says that if we abide in Christ, we'll bear much fruit, but apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And part of this fruit is love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That if we don't spend time with, God, with, with the Lord, we won't have any of those things. We're not going to have joy if we don't spend time with the Lord. Here's the thing. If someone never has joy, and there are, there are seasons, there are dry times, there's spiritual attack. Some people go through seasons of depression. There, there are Mitigating circumstances in many cases. But if we're looking at the broad amount of time, we have to be cautious. If we can't choose joy, we're likely not spending time with the Lord. And every time you, you take a step of obedience to the Lord, it requires you to spend more time with Him. I'll just tell you this. At every stage in my life, when I got married, I had to spend more time with the Lord because I wasn't really ready to be a good husband. Same thing with my kids. Same thing with pastoring. At every stage of the church, my spiritual walk has had to grow in order to allow me to deal with what was going on. The same thing is true with serving, that sometimes when we serve, it's not everybody else's fault. What that is, is, is it requires us to spend more time with the Lord, because if you start to serve for the first time, you're going to need to have a stronger relationship with the Lord. At some point, it needs to be in process, not that you've arrived yet. If you take a step up in leadership, it's going to require more. You, get, you can't stay the same if you take up more responsibility. And number two, evaluate our reasons for not serving. 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. The point of this message isn't condemnation, like, oh, I've got to do something. But the reality is Jesus served so that we would serve, but not with bitterness, but to serve with joy. We're called to serve one another with joy. And if we're serving and there isn't joy, there may be a few things going on. 
again, there may be dry times, there may be mitigating circumstances, maybe difficult challenges in your family, but other reasons, you may have unforgiveness in your heart. It's hard to have joy doing anything if you have unforgiveness. And it may not even be people around you now, it may be from the past. It will steal your joy. Unforgiveness is destructive. We may have the wrong motives for serving. If we're serving, for example, to get a position and we don't get the position we want, then it may be revealing something. If, if we're serving just so we check a box, then that's not really serving. Just showing up, though appreciated, is not really ha- is the same as actually serving. It could be revealing a stronghold. That's an area that the enemy has in our life that, that, that needs to be dealt with. If it's a stronghold, maybe it may have been there for a while. Or maybe just spiritual warfare. There may be something going on. The enemy wants to prevent us from going spiritually, wants to prevent what God could do through you if we actually served with a joyful spirit. 1 Peter 4.10. God has given each, everyone say each, of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. We are to be contributors and not consumers. Francis Chan said this. Everyone, we're almost done here, but hear this. The moment we begin to believe that our church can be healthy while we sit on the sidelines, we have given up on God's plan of redemption. The church will never reach this goal unless each part is working properly. It also means that if we are not active in the church, we are hurting our brothers and sisters. One paralyzed leg forces the rest of the body to work twice as hard until we and every person in our church are actively ministering we will not have an accurate picture of what the church was created to be. So here's some next steps. We're, we're doing this month of, Sharon, Johnny, you can come up if you want. We're doing um, this month of, of, you know, dream teams or serving. And uh, there's a dream team catalog out there if, if you want to look at that. And there's a lot of different ways to serve. And maybe ways that you haven't thought of, because I know some people can't serve on Sunday mornings. There are other ways. We have a, uh, I wouldn't say older couple. She would say mature couple, but she would come up with something really funny to say, because she's really funny. But they actually come in, and they actually will clean the office. One of them helps with the, with the books, the church books. The other one will help bring snacks to the staff. There's a bunch of different ways to serve. I know those of you that are creative, they want creative people in the kids' ministry who aren't just teaching, but making things really creative and out of the box. So what we're doing here is if, if you are serving, you get somebody else to serve, or if you get somebody else to serve, even if you're not serving, you get a shirt, you get this shirt. Again, this is more like a hanky. But, um, and if you start serving, they get a Dream Team shirt. A couple next step is to take a first step of serving. Or maybe it's to start serving again. Maybe if you're, you once served and you're not serving now, maybe it's a matter of finding the right spot. Like where, where could I thrive and where, where's needed and where can my gifting serve? And I understand different seasons, different things you can do. If you're currently serving, I want to ask you to really pray about how you can help your area of ministry. How do you help it improve? Not just show up. How do you make it better? And for some, take a step up in leadership. And sometimes people just want to start from nothing to right in the the throes of leadership. And that's hard to do. You know, normally people, as you start to serve, that will come to the surface. Some have a gift of leadership. Some have a gift of administration. So where might that be helped? Some have a gift of creativity. Stephanie, I, I've been using her in this one because she was really hard to find a really spot for because she would do something. She had a servant's heart. So she tried to serve all over the place, but she's like, this, I don't think this is it. We finally find out she's super creative, which probably makes sense why you don't like to manage anything long term, right? But she's helped design a lot of the creative stuff around here and made a lot of the things look way better. It's a matter of finding what is my giftings? What are my skills? What do I have time to do? How can I make more time? And and see what it does. And now she's been a great addition to the teams. If you close your eyes and bow your head. As we talk about in this series, if you're here 
And as we open up talking about shallow living, you're sitting there saying, hey, look, I don't want to live a shallow life. I, I want to be a person of depth in this culture that's so shallow. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Like, I want whatever that looks like, God, I want you to, I want to be a person of depth. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Go ahead and you put your hands down. And then the last one, if you're sitting there saying, you know what? Um, I'm open to serving. I don't know where that is, but I at least want to pray about. You're not, committing, you're not committing to anything right now, but I want to pray about actually serving somewhere. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I'm not even going to look at you. Just go ahead and raise your hand. Go ahead and put your hand down. And lastly, if you're here and Jesus is not the Lord of your life, if you're to die right now, you don't know if you go to heaven or hell, but you want to be right with God. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I know if you're watching online, I can't see your hand, but God sees your hand. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. But don't just repeat these words. Mean it. You're talking to God himself, the creator of all things. And know that this prayer doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. The prayer is the way we receive what he's done for us. So just pray. Say, dear Lord, forgive me of my sins. I've messed up and I can't fix myself. I repent. Turn me from my path. Put me on your path. I receive your free gift of salvation. Be the Lord of my life, the leader of my life. I believe that you died for my sins and you rose again supernaturally. Show me how to live and show me how to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Jace. Are we willing to be contributors and not just consumers? I was thinking about this, and it, it kind of is even more of a challenge for me now to think about it because it's not just about me, but it's also about the next generation. Because So my wife and I, we have two kids. We have a one-year-old and we have a four-year-old. And so we just had, as, as Pastor Jace was saying, we had our trunk or treat last week, which, which was a great time, beautiful day. Um, our oldest, Zeke, who's four years old, had a wonderful time and lots of fun playing on the different games and going around to all the really well-decorated trunks. But this year, we, we made it an effort with him um, to try to make sure that he's starting to grow in an attitude of serving. So for part of the event, we're like, okay, buddy, now we're going to take some time. We're going to give some candy away to other people because we, we were doing a trunk. We were the dinosaur family. So we were passing out candy, and, and it's something that I know is... is a growing and taking steps into. And I think God has that for each area of our lives. No matter, or no matter what phase of life we're in, we're always called to take a new step. So for him, we're trying, we're, it's the very early stage. Like, okay, it's not just about me. How can, how can I serve other people and show them in a tangible way that God, that God loves them? Let's, let's give out some candy. So it's an important thing, also a challenge for me, because it's like, how, how am I living? And what, is, what are my kids seeing in me? Am I being just consuming right now, or am I actively contributing? So it's a great challenge for, for all of us here today. Great message. All right, I have a few um, reminders for you as we get ready to close here. You should have received a connection card when you came in, which they're putting up on the screen right now. It looks like this. You can put um, contact information on the front there, and then on the flip side of it is a spot where you can put any next steps that you feel like the Lord is calling you to take, as well there, as, well as a spot there with the lines that you can write down a prayer request or a praise report. We're happy to, to pray with you, to celebrate with you what good things are going on in your life, or, or to support you again in prayer if there's something we can um, pray with you about. Then on the end of the connection card, if you're a guest today, you see this guest ticket. And if this is your first, second, or third time joining us, we invite you to fill this out and hold on to it. Don't drop it in the buckets that the ushers are going to send by you in just a moment, but hold on to that and take it out our double doors to, to guest services. They have a special gift to give you, and it's different each time that you come here to Red Church, so we want to make sure that you receive that. So make sure you hold on to that ticket so you can get your special gift. All right, we're also going to receive offerings at this time, tithes and offerings at this time. So if our ushers would go ahead and come forward. At Red Church, we believe that we can honor God in a variety of, of ways through, through our music, by, by loving our community, like through our event last week, and through our giving. And I want to encourage those of you who are giving what your giving is doing. So we've been talking about the trunk or treat. This is one of our biggest things that we do at Red Church. And as Pastor Jay said, we had like 2,300 or more people come to this event. 
And those of you who are giving have a part in that. I know even during the event, we, were, we had so many people coming, we had to run out a couple more times to get more candy in. So those of you who are giving are part of, and it's not just candy. What we are doing is, and for those of you who are part of this, we prayed going into this event, we are planting seeds for people to be able to come to church and see what church is like in a, in a, in a way that is approachable for them, to be able to come to an event like this. They may be more likely now to, to come back when they see your love and your generosity. So thank you to those of you who give because you have a part of what we are doing and sharing God's love with our community in a practical way. You see up here on the screen different ways that you can give and support Bread Church. You can text to give, and there's a phone number up there on the screen to do that. You can give online at redchurch.cc forward slash give. You have your offering envelope that you received in your bulletin you came in today, or you can give on our app. So at this time, I'll go ahead and release our ushers. They're going to bring those buckets by. You can drop your connection cards and any offering envelopes into those buckets. We also have our growth track today. Growth track today is Red 101. You get to learn more about who Red Church is, and um, we get to learn a little bit more about you as well. We want to be able to connect with you and get you plugged into the right places here at Red Church. We do have um, child care available for that so, that, so that doesn't have to be an issue for you to be able to stay, and there's snacks provided as well. So we'd be, we would love for you to be able to stay and, and take the growth track with us, get to learn a little bit more about who we are and what we believe here at Red Church. In order to get to the growth track room, you can head straight out the double doors in the back, take a left, and it'll be the first door on your right. All right, we are going to have um, some people up here up front um, to pray with you. If you'd like to receive prayer and have someone agree with you in prayer, we'd be more than happy to do that. So after we've concluded the service here, there will be people up front here to pray with you. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and invite one of our elders. Uh, Frank is going to come up here, and he's going to pray a prayer of blessing over us. So if you would please stand with me at this time, we'll go ahead and receive the, the blessing. Thank you, Nathan. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are created in your image, but we're created to serve you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will inspire each and every one here hearing this message today to want to give, to give to serve you by serving others. Fill our hearts with joy in, in just being able to use the gifts that you have given us. We praise you, we thank you, and we ask your blessing upon each and every one here. In Jesus' name, amen. I might be halfway through this valley.